Yes. Um, welcome, everyone, to this trial lecture of um, Laura Garrison on the topic of accessibility in um, data um, visualization. And um, we have a committee here. Um, I invite, I invite uh, Chris Wilson Ding and Uwe Wolter, who will be assessing this trial lecture. Laura will give her presentation for 45 minutes, and then we will have time for questions from the audience. And then you will be asked to leave um, both physically and uh, remotely, and the committee will deliberate um, on the results of this trial lecture. And also, reminder um, in um, two weeks' time on the 16th, um, Laura will have a PhD event um, on the condition that this is successful today. All right. Laura, please. All right, so thanks everyone for coming and listening to this lecture on accessibility and data visualization, whether you're here physically or virtually. So I'd like to start off with a quote. So I think most of us are familiar with the saying, a picture is worth a thousand words. But what I really like is the caveat that Alberto Cairo has. So a picture is worth a thousand words if you know how to read it. And so what he's touching on here is the concept of visual literacy. And what that essentially means is, can you as an audience or a user confidently and correctly identify what a picture is saying? And then the thing that we think about then is what are the consequences if someone can't understand this? Um, so meaning the picture and by extension, the data that drive that picture is inaccessible. And this is important to think about because we live in an era of data, which is not easily digestible or understandable in many cases because it's complex. In some cases, it's actually inaccessible because it's private or it's so complicated to work with that it's functionally impossible. And there's just a lot of it. So if you think about the personal data that you have from your devices, from uh, even your browsing history, there's, there's a ton of it. And one of the fantastic things about visualization is they can be used to help make people uh, help people make sense of data. It can make it easier to consume, explore, and understand. And they can capture attention. They can, in some cases, transcend language barriers, be used to validate information, and highlight important data to communicate a particular message. And this is especially common in fields like data journalism. So if we have this example here. This is from the most recent IPCC report. And what it's showing is global near surface air temperature and the associated socioeconomic pathway features from low temperature rising, which means a sustainability initiative, up into the very high, which is unbridled fossil fuel use. And so this is a fairly complex graphic, but if we spend some time with it, we can understand what it is the scientists were trying to share and communicate with this graphic. And the reason we're able to do this and why visualization works so well is that it leverages our visual perceptual system. So essentially we can visually process certain information almost immediately without conscious thought. And this allows us to organize data into simple visual patterns like this. For example, data can be grouped by their physical proximity or by shape. And we can identify outliers very quickly and easily by assigning different hues or intensities to these data items. But the problem is that this doesn't work the same for everyone. So 15% of the global population lives with some form of disability. And this can impact their ability to read these visualizations that we're trying to share this complicated information with. And what that does, it essentially leaves them out of important public discourse and information that can impact their lives. And so that brings us to what were the main topic of today's lecture, accessibility. And so the definition that I really like that I found for this is accessibility is the practice of making information, content, and functionality, functionality is key in this as well, fully available to and usable by people who have disabilities. And so then if we break this down, what am I talking about with disabilities? So disability can encompass many things. Um, what I'll talk about mainly in this lecture are three sort of categories of disabilities. So there's visual disabilities, this can include, I think most people are familiar with the idea of color blindness or color weakness. It's one of the more well-known impairments where certain types of color receptors in your eyes don't work as well or simply don't work at all. And that blocks out certain uh, colors. So for example, if you're colorblind, you would have difficulty seeing the number that's inside of this image. So is anyone, is there anyone here that can't? Okay, yeah, 
So you're left out of a lot, and I'm very sorry for you. So I can mostly, but exactly this kind of combination. I yeah. Yeah, so it affects uh, European men actually more than um, other groups like uh, Asians, and uh, it's men especially more than women. So it's something to be aware of. But it's not just colorblindness, right? There's blindness and low vision. And then if we look at a different category with cognitive and learning disabilities, this can include cerebral palsy or dementia. And with motor disabilities, this can include Parkinson's disease or arthritis. And there's not just disabilities like this, there's also situational disabilities that all of us can experience in our lives at some point. And these are just a few examples I have, uh, but a visual disability can be like you're looking at your phone and it's really, really bright out. So that's, um, that's an accessibility issue if you can't see what's on your screen. Uh, cognitive disability, this, this can be similar to being in a really loud bar where you're trying to listen to a message on your phone when there's a lot going on, there's a lot of sound and it's hard for you to focus or you're looking at your phone while you're racing to catch the bus and you need to get directions fast and you're just stressed. Or a motor disability can be when you're holding your kid while you're trying to use a device or you're a machine operator and you need a hands-free solution. These all fall into some type of situational or environmental disability, which means it's important for us to think about this, not just for the subgroup of people that can be sometimes inconvenient to think about. And so what I'm focusing on with this lecture and what hopefully you'll come away with after this is a knowledge of what accessibility is in the context of data visualization, who can benefit from using accessible practices in visualization, the guidelines that are in place and where they're failing so far and what we can do better, and the modalities and assistive technologies that are available to make these visualizations accessible and some examples of how these can be um, used. And so I've briefly introduced accessibility and who could benefit. So now let's discuss the guidelines that are in place for the moment. So a huge number of data visualizations, especially those that cater to the public, in the case of this data journalism area that I mentioned, and other forms of communication and outreach, these are published on the web. So there's a lot of guidelines that are very web focused. <laughs> so this began in 1999. The first version of web content accessibility guidelines were published through the W3C's Web Accessibility Initiative, with the most recent update being in 2018. And the guidelines here fall under four main principles called POR. So perceivable is, can you detect that the visualization or the object in the um, website is even there? Is it operable? Can you use it? Is it understandable? Do you get it when you look at it or use it? And is it robust? So does it work on different browsers, on different devices? <laughs> and these have been expanded on within the visualization community through a, um, a tool or a evaluation system more accurately called Chartability. So this is a heuristics-based accessibility evaluation system that builds on the WCAG principles, these poor principles that I mentioned before, um, plus three others that are unique to the challenges in data visualization. So this includes compromising, which essentially means that information and system redundancies must be in place within a visualization. It should be assistive, so you should have visual and non-visual representations of the data or the visualization. And it should be flexible. And what this means is that there should be user agency in the visualization. So the user should be able to do something with it. And in spite of these guidelines, there's a huge number of uh, home pages on the web that fail to meet accessibility standards. This is a staggering number that uh, I find very surprising. And one example of that that um, I wanna share is this visualization of the 2020 US presidential election results. And this is a visualization that's on the Guardian's homepage. So this is a very large news site. And so let's uh, experience together the deeply maddening exercise of trying to use a screen reader for this, which is what someone who's visually impaired would have to do. And here's to hoping my audio works. Arizona, graphic. You are currently on a graphic. To begin interacting with the contents of this image, press Control, Option, Shift, Down Arrow. No visible title to interact. No visible title to interact. So that sucks. Like there's um, the entire visualization is essentially a black hole. 
you know that something's there, so it's perceivable, but it's not operable. You can't understand anything that's in there. And you, as a visually impaired person, are completely walled off from understanding what states flipped, if Trump is about to be your next president or not. Very sad times. And that brings me to this key point that accessibility is not just a feature. So it's not something where you make this visualization, it's awesome, and then you just bolt on a bunch of accessibility stuff at the end. So accessibility is necessary for a user's experience to even exist. And so then how do we think about accessibility throughout the entire process? So this is a list of things that I found that are useful. And a lot of these also as a bonus fall into just good design practices anyway. So first thinking about who are your users? What do they need to do with the visualization? Are they going to look at it? Or are they going to be making something? What are the data characteristics, which of course dictates the kind of chart that you're gonna be developing? Is it gonna be a static visualization? Do you wanna build in interactions? If you're designing for someone, again, here's your user who has a motor disability, uh, you need to be careful with the interactions that you choose. How do you wanna scaffold that information? So do you wanna give them a wall of information or will you give them uh, a way to navigate that more easily? Uh, you need to think about the modalities that are available, sight, sound, touch, uh, for example, and in corollary, the assistive technology that's available. So does it need to work with the screen reader? So for the rest of this lecture, I'll be talking about these individual modalities and examples, and I'll start with the easiest one, sight. And this covers a lot, visual accessibility covers a lot of basic visual design guidelines that can be helpful, especially for people who have cognitive disabilities. And the structures that you set up in here can facilitate access to other modalities, such as incorporating sound, and I'll talk about that more later. So the basic visual elements that I'll be talking about include color, contrast, and text. And then you can build on those and put them together into things like chart choice, how you abstract the information, and how you encode the style that you encode that information. And as a sneak peek, this kind of chart is bad for everyone, and I'll go through why. So starting with color, I mentioned this with colorblindness, it affects a lot of people. Um, ways that we can deal with this are using accessible palettes that preserve contrast. So that would be these palettes here that are in the um, top, top image. And it's good to avoid colors, color combinations that um, don't have enough contrast. So famously is the red-green colorblindness. Essentially what looks like is this red and green here. If you have color weakness or blindness, you don't have sufficient contrast to really be able to tell those apart. Instead, consider using something like magenta and green, and then you have much better contrast and color here. And if we bring up this pie chart that I'll be uh, talking about more, you see that this is failing because it has red and green and it has purple and blue. So it's not great in terms of color. You can also use things other than color to communicate meaning. So these two uh, right images are from this chartability heuristics uh, tool that I mentioned. You can use patterns, you can use shapes, you can pair that with color to make something uh, even more clear and do a double encoding. You can add text. So the bars in the top right have actual numerical assignments that makes them easier to understand. And you can also consider using interactions as a way to communicate meaning like in this GIF here. And it's not just about color choice. Uh, I mentioned contrast, but this is important, especially in cases of low vision. So here you're taking an element like a bar and you're comparing it to the colors of any element that it touches or that it lies in front of. And the color of that element is the foreground color and the colors adjacent are the background. And when you compare these colors, you get a contrast ratio. So for non-text, the suggested ratio is three to one. So there's examples of successes and failures of that in the top right image. Or if you wanna go super minimal and not use color, you can just add a stroke and this uh, bottom graph also works. And uh, this pie chart again, fails at uh, the contrast ratio because of the lighting. Uh, it, it ends up violating these uh, contrast ratio guidelines. And there are a lot of tools, many of which are available online that let you check if you're meeting these color and contrast accessibility guidelines. And one that I really recommend trying uh, to see if your design choices work is this dark mode, um, dark reader. 
And this is common, not just for disabled, but most of our devices have an option to automatically go into dark mode to save your eyes as you're using your device at night. And you can use things like dark reader to check if you need to come up with an alternative color scheme for um, users who are in this um, uh, setup. And the last basic element I'll talk about here is text. So the way you ladder your text or the text that you include can help to establish a visual hierarchy that not only can be picked up by a screen reader, but also is easier for someone who has a cognitive disability to follow. So this includes title, having a good summary, having clear captions, having labels. So this visualization of common desktop screen readers by high charts is an example of a good um, constructed uh, text setup. Text size should also be um, no smaller than nine point or 12 pixels. And typeface should be sans serif. So serif is when you have the little feet and that's harder, especially for people with cognitive disabilities to understand. And this pie chart, again, is not great in terms of text. The text is um, small. Obviously, this is a shrunken image, but in the original size, the text was too small. And there's no title, there's no summary, there's no captions. So if we put this together and think about chart choice, so for these next few examples, I'll be focusing on how this works really with people who have cognitive impairments. So again, when you're thinking about tasks, if you're asking someone to read proportions, so for example, this is a pie chart, a stack bar chart, and a tree map, and I'm asking you to identify what the largest element is. And so a study looked at this with people who had cognitive disabilities, and they found that although people liked the pie charts because they reminded them of pizza slices, it's not useful for actually accurately estimating the task, which is reading the proportions. So there the suggestion is to use tree maps or stack bar charts in place. An abstraction is another thing to consider with cognitive and learning disabilities. Um, and you can think about playing with abstraction to help transcend differences in education and connect more with people's experiences. So for example, this chart is asking you to determine if spending is overall increasing or decreasing. And so with a cognitive disability, this is actually in the study that I'm referencing down here, this was hard for people to, to actually identify correctly. And what they found is that using glyphs or icons or symbols, so here substituting in dollar signs that are discreetly arranged along here, reduces abstraction and helps people better reason about the data that they're trying to show. So read the chart better. And related to this is using discrete encodings instead in some cases. Again, this is especially helpful for people with cognitive disabilities, but there's other work, um, for example, estimating uncertainty where discretizing data can be more useful to accurately get information than these continuous things like, um, so an axis aligned chart would be like a bar chart here. And instead of having these continuous bars, you break up the data into these chunks. So in this case, it's using circles and making it so that it's kind of countable makes it easier to compare. So, and that can facilitate uh, comprehension for faster and more accurate reads, especially when the columns that you're being asked to compare are further apart on the axis. And then the, the last point in this visual, um, this visual modality that I want to talk about is uh, please don't give people seizures. So if anyone remembers, there was this huge Pokemon uh, panic about a decade ago. And what happened is 12,000 kids in Japan had minor illnesses ranging from nausea up to full-blown seizures from watching an episode of Pokemon. And what this contained was flashes that were happening at a rate of higher than three times a second. It was a lot of red flashing over a huge area of the cartoon. And I didn't put it on because that would violate <laughs> all of the accessibility things, but it actually hurts my eyes to look at if I just look at like a single still of it. So if you want to risk a seizure, you can check it out um, after this and let me know what you think or, or not. But uh, the way you can check this if you're really addicted to using red flashing lights is you can check it through tools like uh, PEAT here that will give you validation for um, seizure inducement or not. So next we'll move on to sound. So auditory accessibility, uh, once we're leaving this visual space, is the most common and low cost accessible modality. 
uh, something to keep in mind here is that it is serial processing. So it's slower than the visual system. So I can't show you something like any of these cues here and have you identify the outlier really quickly. Because if I give you a wall of sound, will, will you actually be able to identify the data point in this huge wall of like 30 sounds that are playing at you simultaneously? So it doesn't work as well. So complexity becomes a problem. And you can address this, though, with good information structure. And your main options for using auditory um, methods are speech or sonification, which essentially is any channel that is not speech. So starting with speech, the assistive, assistive technology that's uh, used for this would be a screen reader that converts text into speech. And examples of this include Windows uh, has narrator, uh, Mac OS or iOS has voiceover. And the way this is achieved are through HTML image attributes, or more recently through SVG ARIA attributes. And the way you navigate through a screen reader is using a keyboard uh, or doing swipe or tap gestures. And this can be problematic again, if you're someone with a motor disability. And the standard for a good screen reader experience, which I'll play in just a minute here, is a relatively linear experience. And so in this case, they have a summary, there's the x-axis, there's the y-axis, there's a legend, and then there's all the individual data points. And the experience is very linear. So the user pretty much goes in this pathway. So summary, x-axis, y-axis into the data. And this clip is from work that was presented at uh, one of our visualization conferences earlier this year. And the audio is very sped up, but uh, hopefully you'll get the idea. So it's linear and you just, once you get around the axes, you just go data point by data point. So it's, it's a kind of kludgy experience. But the ways that you handle uh, handle actually getting something to be picked up through a screen reader is uh, mainly through alt text. So it's static, it's succinct. You don't have that much control over the granularity of the information. And you can, of course, have really, really bad alt text like this. Uh, a picture containing a shape is totally not useful. And this is what the caption generated when I automatically dumped this image into PowerPoint. So you have to be a little bit on it as the creator. So this would be a good example of alt text, something that says the chart type, the type of data, the reason why you have the chart, and ideally somewhere else, a link to the data source. So this could be something like a line chart that shows the number of coffees bought per day from Salmon each month of the last year. Fall and spring months have more coffee sales. And this one I'll just briefly mention because I found references to this long description text on a number of accessibility blog posts. You use this in place of alt text in HTML image tags that accept a URL or a URI. But the problem is it's deprecated in HTML5 and it's not supported in most browsers. So you'll end up with nothing, which is not great. So don't use long description. The other way that is sort of the gold standard for screen reader accessibility is just putting a data table on in addition to the chart. And so what this does, it does gives the user more agency than alt text because they can actually navigate every single data point through this grid structure that the screen reader can traverse. But I think it's pretty obvious to see that this is a very tedious and time consuming experience. And it takes a lot of mental effort to find patterns. So if I wanted to know the richest country according to its health or something like that, these types of correlations are really difficult to figure out just from looking at a table. So this isn't a great experience. The user has access to the table, but they'll still miss out on the context that a graph could provide if you have only this table. And something that was just released in this 2018 uh, guidelines um, as well would be uh, ARIA attributes in SVG, which support marking up structured graphics, which includes charts, maps, and diagrams uh, to allow designers to annotate individual and groups of graphical elements. So you can actually get a hierarchy and notion of nesting. And these can include uh, labels, like, so things like the ARIA label, 
and you can use this to reference the ID of your title and description elements in your SVG that the screen reader can then pick up. And you can also assign roles to each SVG element, which essentially tells the screen reader that it exists and it should read it or that it should ignore it. And there is out of the box support for ARIA in uh, really popular uh, um, libraries and APIs like Vegalite and HiCharts. HiCharts is mentioned consistently as a uh, system or API that is very well adhering to accessibility guidelines. And I mentioned the linear structure of screen readers with the, the really fast talking penguins data set, but this is an example of a new and more advanced structure of a visualization for screen readers that's using these ARIA attributes in a hierarchical manner that's giving the user a lot more agency and letting them explore a chart and the data the way that someone with sight would be able to do. So I thought it would be easier to show this as um, the flow diagram, but what the user will have is they can see the summary and then they can navigate through to the X axis and into the intervals and then individual data points or straight over to the Y axis or into categories according to the legend or into a grid structure of um, individual data points. So you can chunk the data in different ways and have a much more, what I would say, organic experience with interacting with these charts. And if you totally biff it and forget to do anything with your chart and just map it or just save it as a JPEG, there are solutions uh, for extracting those uh, chart information into uh, something that's accessible by a screen reader. So there's uh, methods, for example, using convolutional neural networks that extract the charts for screen reader accessibility by first analyzing the contents of the bitmap image, detecting the chart type, reading the labels, extracting the shapes, and decoding the stored data for the screen reader. <laughs> so moving on now to sonification, which is non-speech. This includes audio channels like uh, pitch, tempo, volume and timbre. Timbre might be a little unfamiliar. That's the texture of the sound. And uh, research has shown that uh, using sonification is faster than speech to perform tasks, but it's not necessarily more accurate. Uh, so for example, people really like pitch as a way to navigate a space, but it's not, not necessarily accurate in the estimations of data values. So here's an example of a sonification that's um, used for education and outreach purposes. So this is a sonification of uh, this July's uh, London heat wave. Um, it's using data from three weather stations where some of the hottest temperatures were experienced. And as you listen to this, the louder and rougher sounds mean higher temperatures and you'll hear it rise in the day and then fall at night. And this is a really short clip. The ticking is the hours play it one more time. And so this sounds really interesting, but for me, at least listening to this, it's hard to understand what exactly I'm listening to if I were to start to analyze this. Like I can hear the overall trends, but understanding the nuances is a little bit difficult. And this gets into just the data mappings to the audio channels are not always intuitive either. So for example, if you're thinking of ordinal data, so like your level of education, how does that match map to something like volume? It's not entirely clear and there's more work that has to be done for this. And one more example that I, I have to share because this is really cool and it was just released this week. Has anyone heard this yet? Yes, it's so cool. So this is uh, debunking years of being told that sound cannot uh, exist in space. And this is the sound of a black hole. Super cool. So this is translating astronomical data into sound. The uh, scientists are extracting out the sound waves. And then of course they have to be synthesized up to the range of human hearing. 
So this is another really excellent example of sonification for education outreach to get people to care and be excited about science. And if you're interested in more things like this, there's this uh, Data Sonify Twitter account that I got lost in. So there are examples of um, tools for exploration, anal analysis, and creation of data that uses sonification. So this is one example I wanted to highlight. It's the SAS Graphics Accelerator. So it includes sonification, speech, and tables to access visualizations that are produced by their software. It's available as a Chrome plugin. And what it does is it inserts metadata into HTML5 output for the charts that are created. And this is a clip from one of their tutorials for how sonification is used. So data points that are low on the y-axis have a low pitch, and data points that are high on the y-axis have a high pitch. The x-axis is mapped to your left and right speakers. The data points on the left side of the x-axis are in your left speaker, and the data points on the right side of the x-axis are in your right speaker. Let's play this graph from left to right. Let's go back to the left side of the histogram and explore each data point interactively. Horsepower equals 60, percent equals 0 0.2. Horsepower equals 100, percent equals 6.1. Horsepower equals 140, percent equals 15. So that's one of the ways that you can use sonification to actually query data. And this is using pitch. This is one of the more popular ways to encode continuous data items. So moving on now to touch. So tactile perception is very common in educational and outreach settings like this um, uh, painting that someone who's blind can explore. This is um, something that was uh, promoted in uh, VRVIS. And what it does is enables the visually impaired to spatially reason about data, which you don't get as much of with sonification. You got a sense of it with sound coming in your left or right speaker, but it's it's not as spatial as actual tactile perception can be. So it allows you to uh, explore information that you're interested on demand. You can move your hands over the space. Pre-attentive processing of multiple elements still isn't possible. So if you have something where you got really excited about your grid lines and you have a lot of content elements or you have ambiguous textures, this is going to be super hard for someone to, to understand what it is you're trying to communicate. It requires motor movement, which again, for someone with a motor disability, if you have Parkinson's, this is hard to navigate. And establishing orientation is critical. Um, so this is work from uh, colleagues where there's notch in the side that lets you navigate around and understand how to read the data. <clears throat> uh, and one of the, the biggest downsides and why tactile um, modality is not used as often as, uh, um, for example, sound, is that it, it, it can be costly in terms of both time and money to produce. <clears throat> so Thinking through the different types of tactile modalities, there's Braille, which is probably what most of us are familiar with. So these are often used in data visualization as labels to convey precise values and textual elements, such as legends or tables. Uh, an example that I thought was interesting to share would be uh, this tool called Spark Braille. So this is using Unicode Braille symbols that are inspired by spark lines which are really tiny graphics that give you general trends. So the idea with Spark Braille is to give you the gist of a chart um, and it's on a refreshable display, which can consist of something like a Braille mouse, which is essentially, it looks like a standard computer mouse, but it has a small tactile display unit. And there's newer things coming on the market, uh, Braille touch pads. So this dot pad is just new this summer. And this is a smart Braille device that uh, has touchable images for the visually impaired. So this is really cool. This gives a lot of new options for people. We can also think about embossed prints. So these are static on raised paper. Uh, tactile representations of common charts can be things like scatter plots or network diagrams like I have in these two, two right columns from this study. And they enable uh, faster reading of correlation patterns in the case of scatter plots compared to braille text or tables, or in this case, it was comparing uh, network connections in the network diagram against an adjacency matrix or braille uh, text. <laughs> we can also move into data physicalization. So I have props for this, which Thomas uh, 
graciously let me use so I can pass these around for anyone who's interested in using them. And so a data physicalization or just a physicalization is a physical artifact whose geometry or material properties can encode data. Uh, it encourages engagement because you're actually physically manipulating the thing. So you can explore, you can communicate information and it helps people understand information. And they can be inspired by real world objects such as this honeycomb plots project inspired by honeycombs. And this thing that I'm passing around in this image here, this can, for example, show frequencies of something over a geographic area. So I'll try to explain this and Thomas can tell me if I mess it up. Um, so each of these, so this is aggregating data into these towers and the height of these towers encodes the value of the aggregated data or, or bins. And the angle that you see on the top in these is encoding the data distribution within each of these bins. Thomas is nodding. Good. Okay. So what this does is it gives you a view of the local and the global variation in a data set. And again, I mentioned orientation. There's this notch on the side um, that helps orient you to the data set. And if you're curious to learn more about this, there's this website that has a list of more data physicalizations. So leaving the physical world and moving into the haptic world, uh, you can also have the user feel and interact with a virtual model through a haptic device like this armature shown up at the top, which is a very common way to interact with the data. And you can do this by having engraved regions, enclosures through uh, different degrees of friction. So if you have a categorical data, you can use different amounts of friction to distinguish between different data buckets. Uh, and auditory channels are often used with haptic devices. So for example, in this pie chart here in the upper right, what they're using is a groove to keep people inside the pie chart. And there's resistive walls that delimit the segments of the pie chart. And then each segment of the pie chart has a unique pitch assigned to it. So someone who's interacting with this can see and understand what segments they're in as they explore it. And the aim with haptic feedback is, of course, to achieve realistic tactile feedback as if you're interacting with the real thing. And there's really cool uh, stuff available now. So most devices require direct physical contact, like with this armature, but there are new contactless devices that are becoming available. So if you want to feel like you're living in a Star Trek episode, there's these mid-air haptic technology. Um, they're ultrasonic. And they generate tactile sensations on the user's skin in midair, so you don't need to have direct interaction with the user's body. So these have a lot of promise in medical and surgical training domains, and it's cool to see where this is going. <laughs> I'll briefly talk about smell and taste because it's, um, it's a sensory sort of data physicalization. Smell and taste are really going hand in hand. It's hard to separate them out. They activate multiple sensory channels by having them. Um, examples of this are pretty limited actually in terms of thinking about accessibility. They're more of an experience. So this case is from a workshop where they're using candy to build data visualizations and then you can eat it to cement the experience of the data. So taste and smell can elicit really strong emotional responses. And that means it's really subjective. So it's great if you're doing personalized data visualization. I think there's a good space for this here. The perception can vary between individuals. They have different associations. I love the smell of coffee. Some other people might hate it. I also survive on coffee. So I am habituated to the smell of coffee whereas someone who doesn't drink it might notice it a lot more. So it's hard to have a really controlled study assessing smell or taste. It's very imprecise. But what's more interesting is combining these senses, so sound, sight, and touch especially. And so this is what we call multimodal accessibility. So I've mentioned some examples of this throughout the lecture so far, but essentially what you're doing here is you're combining multiple modalities to overcome the limitations of a single modality or a single assistive device. And so this is most commonly used with speech and nonverbal cues that can include sonification, tactile graphics or haptic feedback. Uh, 
And a couple examples of this are uh, Gravitas, which is the top image here. And this is using speech and haptic gloves together or tactiles, which is this one on the bottom. And this is just a bunch of tactile modalities together. So you have a graphics tablet, physical pie chart that looks like a CD, and a braille mouse with your non-dominant hand. And so I think you've probably gotten that accessibility is not a solved problem. And there's a lot of interesting and active research areas in this space that you need to be aware of when you're developing accessible, accessible visualizations for yourself. So first and foremost, we need broader and more encompassing accessibility standards and guidelines. There's a lot of gaps and there's a lot of things that we're not quite meeting yet. And as I mentioned at the beginning, there's a lot of websites that don't even adhere to the guidelines that are out there. So that's another problem. Uh, we need to look more into non-speech, so sonification you now things uh, for visualization. And so understanding what's intuitive and how that maps actual accuracy. There's very little studies out there, and there needs to be more done in that area before we can like, effectively use sonification for actual data and actual analysis. So, these points are standards project. But for these that are specific accessibility, I mean, providing some sort of how do they find out that it's Are you providing a clear main message? So you're giving like a quick summary. This is something that a lot of data journalism outlets do quite well, but this is something that is always helpful to keep in mind. And it also is helpful for you. If you don't know why you're creating a visualization, then, then what's the point of it anyway? Uh, is your information scaffolded in some way? So are you providing a wall of information to the user that will be difficult for them to navigate? Or are you providing it or setting it up in a way so that it can be having details when the user is asking to learn more of those details? Are the interactions usable? If you have interactions, if you have a static visualization, that's a different discussion. But um, this is really important, again, with motor disabilities to think about how people will actually be using the visualization that you've created. And lastly, is the user able to identify and relate chart elements? So I, if I'm using a pitch to notify someone of a data element, can they relate it to the, the data element that's next to it somehow? Or are you going to give them a legend of the min-max value so they understand where that is in the context of the rest of the data? And as I mentioned before, following these practices are also simply good design practices. And if I go back to this quote that I mentioned at the beginning, our ultimate goal in visualizing data is to help people to better share and understand the data that we're living with. And if you practice accessibility principles, we're giving people the tools that they need to read the pictures that we create that ultimately gives them more agency in managing their own data and managing, for example, their health and participating in larger public discourse that affects all of us. So if anyone's interested in this topic, this is a, I'm sorry, it's a relatively long list, but it's stuff that I thought was interesting uh, for people who want to follow up on this more later. And if there's time, I can try to answer questions about it. Yeah. 
Yes. Time for questions from the audience. I was uh, wondering, I mean, it's great. Uh, a lot of things that you've said for, for the web and the crash. Do you know whether there's like a reason to implement these sort of standards in scientific journals? Because I don't think I've ever gotten like a common that you have to do the accessibility of this bigger. No, there's not. It's really starting with um, web because I think that's the easier place to start because accessibility is so young that we're struggling to make really basic things like bar charts accessible. So then when you're getting into visualizing scientific data, that introduces a little bit more complexity. And I think journals in general are a little bit slower to get on the bandwagon of this kind of thing. So something like chartability, this one I mentioned, so that's coming from within the research community within visualization. So that I think is one of the one of the indicators of a push for for journal publications to have good figures, but it's not it's not enforced. Hmm. And at the conference that you mentioned that it's supposed to change, there was some, some confusion among in the audience. Why is that so fast? Yeah. And there was an interesting explanation from one person who knew about it. Actually, the difference in how they are used. Yeah. It's because when you get taken into the bar, it's going to fall and it's not going to work. Yeah. Yeah. The other is more a question like, I would like to better understand in, in how far this relates to the use of their, their roles. But I understand that for certain purposes, that it may even be legally required to be accessible when the governmental information to the public and it needs to be accessible. But as as we as we at the airplanes that now know the pilots were not blind, we may also have cases where we on this point, see how organization can involve some different artificial intelligence. So, can you uh, say a bit more about what kind of objectives are there uh, to be required uh, accessibility and technified accessibility? I mean, in terms of requirements, I think the requirements that I've come across are really like government level mandates. So, accessibility requirements are. Like accessibility, it feels like it's it's one of these things where it's a buzzword, everyone wants to care about it, everyone wants to do something about it, but it takes a lot of effort to include it because again, like I mentioned, it's not something you can bolt on at the end. And there are companies, again, this is starting a lot from within the tech industry where you will have accessibility champions and their entire job and the reason for being in that company is to make sure that everything that gets shipped is accessible in some way but that's not happening in a lot of companies. And I would say the more like monolithic established companies don't have any notion of that yet. So I think you need to have more governmental policies in place to actually punish uh, people who don't have this before it's more widespread. Rika? Um, we were mentioning and when you said it, in my mind, I was thinking more attraction is really like a big thing for people to come in and And for the fact that the is that like lowering the abstraction makes it easier. So it's more yeah, so maybe I'm thinking of this backwards, but the more abstract something is, the less realistic it is. So if you're thinking of like I'm familiar with this, for example, with like molecules. So a a minimally abstract molecule is like something that you're dumping straight out from the protein data bank and rendering it. But a very, very, very abstracted molecule is a square that you're using to symbolize something. If that. So I was thinking it's more easy to understand this if you are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's actually not. From the studies that have been done, it's easier to connect it to reality. So that's why, for example, with the pie charts, people liked the pie charts because it reminds them of a slice of pizza. It's not accurate, but it makes them think of something that's real. 
So yeah, I was surprised by that too. I thought it would be the other way around where if you have shapes that are more complex, it's harder for people to get, but no, it's uh, so far the research has shown that it's the opposite. Remarked that it's also it's also true for his sentence, it's true for children as well. That you know, sometimes uh, um, it's it's more difficult to to understand the concept of mapping something to something else. So when you think like a bar graph, the height of a bar that this is linked to some quantity, it's difficult to understand. But when you have a like a unit with the next day, like individual dots that you can count, then it's that, that is much something that's easier to grasp uh, um, than like this concept over presented. But I, I had a I had a question actually. So um when we um looking at accessibility, did you come across in your research um uh, um at sort of what would be the gold standards that we are aiming for, right? Because you know you could you could think about multiple things. Well, optimally you would say that you know you would um want a visualization to be as accessible for a person with whatever kind of uh, um, disability than to one who is normal whatever whatever that means or without uh, 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 any specific handicap or neurotypically or uh, uh, um, but that may just not be achievable so what what sort of would be then the the gold standard? Has someone tries to define this in, hmm. in in more detail? I think the closest I've seen that come out is in this uh, chartability, um, and that's where they essentially the answer that he has with it's it mainly one guy that developed that, and he's kind of started a movement around this. But there's also the other work that has been published in this space supports that where. There is no one size fits all. It has to be designed with specific people in mind because what works for someone in terms of interaction for someone with cognitive disabilities that also fits for someone who maybe comes across like a situational disability just will not and will never work for someone with a motor disability. So it's it's really, really user-based, but I think the one broad thing that I can say is, is true is that having multimodal access to visualizations is sort of the gold standard that we're converging to for accessibility. So have visual and non-visual elements that you can choose to use or not use, and it won't impact your experience in a negative way. But if you need it, it's it's there. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I, so we don't forget to keep it remotely. There's a question from Virginia. Um, Regarding sonification, is there a difference between visually impaired and someone without a uh, disability perceiving it? Could a visually impaired person get more from it because they uh, could be more sensitive to sound? Yeah, so there is a study that actually looked at it, and I think I put it on here. It's this, yeah, it's this one, seeing through sounds. So I think in this one, they included in their survey people who had disabilities and those who didn't. And so you, you do have a situation where you'll have people because they're visually impaired, they're really training their ear more to sound, so they can be more sensitive to it. But I, if I remember correctly, it wasn't necessarily that there were significant differences between these two groups. So sound can work really well. It's more just the, the accuracy that's, that's a problem. And there was something really interesting about this too. So there was prior work that said that people who have a musical background are more accurate at identifying pitch, for example. But that was essentially debunked by this study and a number of other related studies that said your musical training does not matter, which I thought was really interesting because I assumed it would. Like I played in band for like 10 years and I feel like I'm good at hearing pitch, but apparently that doesn't matter. Um, I, I have maybe uh, two comments and one question. First comment, I'm quite surprised that the kids were mentioning size of pizza and not size of cake. Um, <laughs> especially kids. The second one, I'm actually quite happy to hear that ISOF is putting quite a bit of uh, attention to it, hearing that it is actually Norwegian-based company. Yeah, they're considered one of the thought leaders in this space, actually. And and the, the, the question is that a lot of the times you were mentioning, for example, for the alternative text for, for visualization, mm -hmm. for example, for journals. They do know what they want to communicate. They specifically write it uh, here. We show um, that there is an outlier here. Mm -hmm. But what if you are trying to design a visualization that's kind of like dynamic based on the data? Like, is there any kind of like helper that can tell you, like, 
what kind of features you want to communicate here, like uh, tell them about um, outliers or something like that. Like something a bit helping to this dynamic part. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was actually Hysoft that had in a blog post or something that was talking about how to deal with dynamic data, but they were suggesting um, still having a summary that's showing, because unless the chart type is also totally changing, you're going to have something that's sort of stable, and then the callouts can be changing with the captions or tooltips that you're providing, so that's like a on-demand sort of thing, okay. and that can be triggered, that event can be triggered when the data are swapped out. Yeah. But yeah, I can try to find that article again, but I'm pretty sure it was Hisoft that was talking about this. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Uh, one question. Uh, for the alt uh, tags, was there a special reason why they were more, like only on the SVGs? Or like, is there some difference in accessibility on SVG? And... You mean for ARIA? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is yeah, it... that's, that's specific to SVG, I think. From what I understand, you, did you find out why it wasn't there on like HTML or anything? Mm. The SVG format itself is it's not XML format, so yeah. you have the higher yeah, yeah, yeah. But then, yeah, of course, but then it should be on the HTML elements too, not the ARIA. It's just an attribute. Mm. Isn't there any kind of warning? So we have like 10,000 data points, and it's it will start on like label, label legend, point one, point two, point. This is going to continue for 99,000. Are you sure you want to continue? I mean, that would be a good feature to add in. Yeah. yeah. Or maybe something, don't panic, but I will continue for the long time. Yeah, no, that would be great. That would be something that you would need to do with more advanced uh, yeah. screen reader stuff. Because yeah. otherwise you'll just... Branded to them. Right, yeah, because otherwise you go through and be like, maybe I'll die before I finish this data yeah. set. I don't know, so... But yeah, for your question, I, I don't know. I know it's specific to SVG. There's something about the structure of SVG that makes ARIA. Okay. I can look at it more and let you know what I find out. Next one. Yeah, so that's that example. So short answer, there's not much, but there is this example I mentioned with this um, SAS graphics accelerator. So that is actively used by um, visually impaired um, analysts to visualize data, but it's it's a little bit sad that it it's it's like a very short list of uh, ways that you can create these. There's also uh, I don't remember what it's called, Sonification Sandbox. So that's another, uh, that's an open source tool. It's not proprietary, but that's a way for um, people to convert their data into Sonify data. So analysts can use it for that. Um, it, they can use that tool as well, but it has, um, it's not fully featured. I think this is a little bit more fleshed out. Who's this? At the moment, they're just trying to figure out who is the show on. For sure, yeah, that's that's one of the things. So there was a survey that was on just accessibility, and it was focused really on visually impaired people mostly. But that was a point that they brought up. They were just like, we're so at the beginning of this that we're still trying to figure out what people need to understand that we're not really at the point of thinking about giving tools for them to create stuff. There's a few, but it's not much. On a, on a related note, I mean, when we go to school, I don't know, in, um, you know, geo uh, geography class, for instance, we are quite used to seeing, well, for instance, color coded maps and, you know, and that's something, that's something that's, that as adults, uh, we just, we just understand and, and realize. So what, have you have you ever looked at or do you have some some information of how these things are done in like actual schools or the visually impaired for for instance? What would be the equivalent there? What, or is this is not done at all? Or hmm. no, they they have them. So these are the tactile sort of maps, and then they'll incorporate sound. So they'll use pitch or something like that to show the categories. So that's that's sort of the state of the art in schools. Um, and actually, in cartography, at least, this uh, accessibility question is 
fairly well addressed relative to thinking about uh, the broader field of visualization, right? So you can print out these uh, 3D maps and yeah. Okay, then uh, uh, thank you all for participating. And um, now the committee members will really sit together and uh, uh, deliberate. And please leave the room. <laughs> Should I just stop hours. the Zoom meeting? <laughs> yeah. Do I stop Zoom completely? Okay.